On behalf of World Harvest Church North Congregation, I want to welcome you to today's program. I'm your host, Pastor Ray Sadakri. I am so looking forward to you getting in the Word of God today. We get on the phone, call your friends and relatives and say, you've got to hear the message today. It's entitled, Three Days That Hell Will Never Forget. Throughout today's program, you're going to see on the bottom of your screen information uh, pertaining to our ministry and uh, how you can get your prayers uh, agreed with through this ministry. And so be looking for that throughout the Word. And when we come back, I want to share some things with you and then pray with you before you leave. Revelation chapter 1, beginning with verse 12, I want to talk to you today about a subject entitled, Three Days That Hell Will Never Forget. And when I talk about hell, I'm mainly talking about those little imps called the demons and Satan. The wisdom of God. Man prides himself on being wise. But when you compare the wisdom of man against the wisdom of God, it pales by comparison, to say the least. God is a strategist. He knew the, the end of a thing before it even began. He's a methodologist. He has method to his madness. That's why he invites us who know him to get to know his ways so that we understand uh, the things he does. If you don't know his ways, just look haphazard. But when you know his ways, uh, he orders your steps. It, it, it's very well thought out. There's nothing by accident or happenstance when it comes to God. Now, we may blow up some things, and we may do some things, and we may burn off our eyebrows, I'm talking about my dear sweet nephew. But God has no accidents. He has a plan. And the wisdom of God is greater than the wisdom of man. Matter of fact, he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And so today I want to talk to you for a little while about God's wisdom. And I believe in it you will see how great your God is. And how loving he is towards you. So look there in verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven stands, one like the Son of Man, clothed uh, with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. I believe uh, Daniel talks about him appearing in the fiery furnace with the three Hebrew men. And his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth when a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. One translation says of hell and of death. Jesus was given all authority and took possession, or may I say, repossession of the keys of death and hell through his death. He says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. Now, I want you to get this inside of your spirit. It was during his death that he took back authority from Satan. You see, we humans understand and, and know and view death as being final. But while Jesus' body lay in the tomb, he was in hell taking authority. What the disciples saw as Jesus being defeated on the cross that day, in the realm of the Spirit, 
he was actually stripping the devil of all his authority over us, over mankind, for all. What looked like the end of Jesus to many Jews that day was really the beginning of his reign over all things. In his death, he took authority. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, please. It says in Ephesians, when we believe in him, we are in Christ. We're in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, talk about we're a new creation in Christ. Well, here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, it says, In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the old body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, say me, you. being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Isn't that good? He has forgiven you of all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having done what? Having nailed it to the cross. Now, in the cross, in the place where he died, look at verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. In what? The cross. Well, I don't know that you're making a whole lot of sense. Well, you got to lay it up, line upon line, precept upon precept. We're going somewhere, right? In the cross, in the dying, in the suffering, people looked at it and says, he said he was the Messiah. He said he was the Christ. He said all authority had been given to him. And yet we see him dying on the cross. And, and I don't see no, no robe. I don't see no crown upon. I don't see him coming into Jerusalem on a white steed horse. I don't see the pomp and the circumstance that, that, that is befitting a king of someone his stature, if he is indeed who he said he was. And then they look at him on the cross and they think, there wasn't much to this guy after all. But what they did not realize was, while he was dying on the cross, and, and once he gave up his breath, he did not ascend, but he first descended and went down to hell, and he disarmed principalities and powers, and he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them through the power of the cross. Now, this seems like foolishness to me, that God would have us preach something as foolish as the cross, but in that cross is the power of life life and eternal life but we don't comprehend that in our flesh it has to be revealed to us by faith in our spirit man now I want you to take you back when Jesus was not very well known he's coming down to the river Jordan where John the Baptist is baptizing people and he goes into the water and is baptized and begins his earthly ministry he was later then led by the Spirit into the wilderness. You know it, Luke chapter 4. And there he was tempted by Satan. Now, several Wednesday nights ago, I was preaching. While I was preaching, the, the revelation just came out of my mouth. It bypassed my brain. And, and it was to this effect. Satan wanted Jesus to always prove himself. Satan worked through the scribes and the Pharisees trying to get Jesus to do something to prove himself. Even on the cross, they wanted him to come down and to prove himself. And so I was saying about that, God, I said, why is it that you're wanting me to teach on this? And then this weekend, he says, I'll set you up then to get you ready for now to teach my people what I mean. Amen. See, it takes a while for us to even grasp the deep things of God. He has to give it to us little by little by. So here Jesus is, he's, he's baptized, the Spirit comes upon him and leads him out of the, the water and goes up into the wilderness. There he, for 40 days he fasts and prays and afterwards he hungers. And then the, Satan comes and tempts him and says, Jesus, if you're the Son of God, uh, why don't you show it? Turn these stones into bread. Jesus looks at him and says, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, God didn't tell me to turn these stones into bread. So get along. I have no need for you. You know, 
Uh, when Jesus died on the cross, when he ascended, descended into the lower bowels of the earth and went into that place called hell where Satan abides, Satan didn't need one shred of evidence to further prove that Jesus was indeed the Son of the living God. When Jesus showed up, here he has. He's gotten his, his, the princes of this world had come together and crucified the Lord of glory, thinking he was a blasphemer, he was a mocker. He considered himself equal with God. And they said, this man is a blasphemer. We will crucify him. We will use this lie, this, this deceit, and calling him a blasphemer. And we will crucify him and, and do away with him and his miracles. And he will become history. Can you imagine when, when Jesus gave up his ghost, took his last breath after he said, it is finished. Can you imagine what hell felt like when the king of glory came down there outside his body? He came down there in all his authority. Satan looks at him, and I'm sure he turned as white as, as a sheet, and he says, oh, God. And Jesus says, you're right. <laughs> the deceiver had just been deceived. The wisdom of God had just shown Satan how ignorant and foolish he really was when it is recorded in Isaiah 14, 12. I will be like the Most High God. I will exalt my, my throne above the stars of God. I will be greater than God by defiling his creation. And God says, go ahead, make my day. He was down there in hell had the keys of death and hell, and he says, I've got it made. I whooped the man that said he was Jesus, the son of the living God. I have shown myself greater than God. I have fooled the plan of God. It is done. And about the time he, he starts thinking it's good and peaceful and safety, like he talks about there in 1 Thessalonians, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come up on them. And there Jesus was. Give me those keys back. <laughs> okay. You say, well, what's so important about Jesus going to hell and getting the keys of death and hell? Well, up to that point, man always lived in the bondage of fear to death. And God did not want us to live in that bondage. You see, when Jesus showed up in hell, G Satan knew exactly who he was. He was the Son of God. He knew now that he had crucified the Lord of glory. But by then, it was too late. He could not stop what had just happened on the cross at Jerusalem. He couldn't go back and redo it. It was over. Satan's fate was sealed for all of eternity. Look there in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. It messed the Jews up seeing Jesus come as, as a man born of a woman. It, it messed them up. They couldn't, it was hard for them to grasp who Jesus really was in the spirit. You see, Jesus kept his spirit. God kept Jesus' spiritual identity secret. Satan always wants to know, are you the Christ? Are you the son of the living God? If you are, prove yourself. Why did God keep Jesus' spiritual identity secret? Because there was going to come a day when God was going to reveal who he was, but it had to be done God's way so that it would be infallible. I am nothing more than a lawyer up here, and you are the jury. This is the evidence. I am presenting the evidence of Je Jesus' uh, resurrection to you, and it is my job to convince you beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is the risen King and Lord and Savior of all mankind. Paul did the same thing as a Pharisee, a lawyer. 
He went to King Agrippa and he said, King Agrippa, I want to share to you the vision that, that Jesus gave me. And I have been faithful to follow that vision. And as, as Paul started giving his case and the evidence to, to King Agrippa, King Agrippa looks at him and says, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. See, the evidence has to be beyond a shadow of a doubt. God had to do this in such a way that Satan himself, oh, thank you, Lord. Satan himself could not disprove it, could not discredit it, could not annullify it. So God says, I will, I will make Satan a part, an instrument of my plan of salvation. The one who started all. I'm going to show him. Now look there in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have uh, partaken of the flesh and blood, he, Christ himself, likewise shared in the same, that through death, wait a minute, what? Through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So scripture bears out what I'm saying this morning, right? It was in his death. We read it there in Colossians 2. He stripped the principalities and powers of their authority in the death through the cross. There in Revelation 1, he talked about how he was dead, and yet he is alive forevermore. And in his death, he had taken back the authority, the keys of death and hell, right? Yeah. So through his death, he destroyed him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and released those who are those, us, who through fear of death were all our lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give uh, aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful, watch this, he did all he did the way he did. The Jews didn't understand why he came as Mary's son. They didn't understand why he rode a donkey and not a white steed, right? They didn't understand a lot of things about Jesus because he didn't come as a lion, he came as a lamb. And that's what threw them off. But he came in the likeness of man on the account of sin to destroy sin in the flesh so that we who are of sin could be redeemed from sin, right? To be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being what? Yes. Tempted in all points yet without sin. He is able to aid, help those who are tempted. God didn't miss a beat with Jesus did he? Everything that Jesus went through, everything that he suffered, even his death, was to get him to be, God to be able to uh, relate with fallen man and to be able to help them out of the miry clay, pull them up out of that sin, right? And he did it successfully. Now turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor are the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. God's bringing it all to naught. Everything that Satan thought he was going to do is going to come to naught, right? Who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a, my a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. See, we're walking in these revelations, aren't we? And it's for our glory. Which none of the rulers of this age, none of the princes of this world knew. See, we're walking in the, the hidden wisdom of God, are we not? For our glory, uh, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. God is so wise that he, he outwitted the deceiver Satan. Satan was certain that he had defeated God in the garden when he convinced Adam and Eve to sin and placed them in bondage to the fear of death. God told him, Adam, don't eat of the tree of knowledge, for in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. When Adam and Eve eat of the, uh, ate or partook of the forbidden fruit, uh, their souls died, separated from God. When that happened, uh, Satan looks and he says, God, I got you. I have now forever separated your creation, 
the ones you love the most, I have separated them from you. What are you going to do about it now? See, Satan didn't know. This, God had a plan. God has a plan. You think, God, there's death in my life. What are you going to do with this death that's in my life? There's hardship in my life. What are you going to do with this? He said, I'm going to take the broken pieces. I'm going to make a masterpiece out of it. But it's going to take time. It has taken from the fall of Adam till now 6,000 years for God to start revealing what we're getting today. 6,000 years. God is very patient. It takes him a while to say something. But when he says it, you can bank on it. So, I, so Satan thought. He, he thought in himself. He says, I've got God on the ropes. But God, he, he took what Satan meant for evil and turned it around for our good. If you really want to know how powerful and how good God really is, then look at how, what he can do with the worst thing that Satan and hell had to offer. Death, sin, separation, right? What did God do with it? Hang on. The Holy Spirit had told Paul here in 1 Corinthians, if the princes of this world had known what they were do really doing, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The spiritual identity of Jesus, like I said a while ago, was kept secret from Satan until Jesus' death. Now, it was on the cross when Jesus gave his life. All of hell knew who Jesus really was in the spirit. Isn't that amazing? In his death, get this, in his death, while he was on that cross and his body had given up the life and he was, the body was dead, hell was getting a revelation of Christ. But, but earth was yet to get the revelation because he was dead. The, Jesus says, tonight I'm going to be betrayed and all of you will be caused to stumble, to fall away, to become offended because of me. When, when, the, when the disciples saw the, the Roman centurions take him out of the garden of Gethsemane and take him into Pilate's hall and Herod's hall to be judged, they said, it's over. There was discouragement in their heart and they gave up. Peter went back to his old ways. They were made to stumble. They thought it was over. But when Jesus died, hell got a revelation. They said, this is the Son of God, and there's nothing we can do about it. Let's just have a party. It's over. But up on earth, there was no revelation yet. But in death, God took death, which was the result of sin. God took death, which is the result of sin. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die, and used it against Satan to redeem man from the fall. I don't comprehend God. I can't. God took, said, Adam, in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. When Adam partook of it, he died. He was separated. He was driven out from the tree of life. When you're separated from life, you're going to have death eventually, right? But God, in his infinite wisdom, says, that thing that Satan made you do that created death in my creation, I'm going to take that death. And I'm going to use death to redeem you back to me. Isn't that good? Satan can have you on the ropes. He can have you bound up by all kinds of sin and demonic behavior and possession. And God can say, I still have a plan for you. You don't see it in the natural. Everybody's given up on you. But in my heart, I know I still have a plan for you. And when you come to your senses, I'm going to take what was meant for evil and make it a testimony that will save millions. God has a plan. He used death. Sean was talking about it in his testimony. See, it was in his past. It was his testimony. I was going through a test. God showed up. Now it's a testimony. I've been redeemed. Death did not redeem man. But Jesus' death did. See, there was something different about Jesus than any other man that has ever lived. From the time of Adam till the time of Christ's return, there was something different about Jesus. They couldn't hard. You know, the scribes and Pharisees look at him and say, where does this man get all this authority? There's no one else that speaks like him. We see his brothers and his sister, and there's his mother Mary. 
Where is he getting all this authority? And, and, and because they would not humble themselves and believe that he was who he said he was, it, they were blinded by their own unbelief. Yet they saw his authority. And it, it, it's like, you know, almost I would believe you, Jesus, but there's a part of me that says, no, this cannot be true. But there was something different about Jesus. It was so different that everybody else could die and not change man. But when Jesus died, it changed all mankind. Something was different about him. Turn with me to Matthew 27. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Isn't that something? They're sitting there watching him die. They, uh, and they put up over his head the accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by uh, blasphemed him, wagging their heads, saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yours. Well, I'm out of time today, but before I leave, I want to encourage you to go on to our website. There you will learn about our core beliefs and values and the vision that God has entrusted into our care. We're literally touching nations around the world through the vision that God has given us. Will you do that today? And I believe you will be truly blessed. Thank you for joining us and for partaking of God's word together with us. We, we celebrate the work that Christ is doing in your life and in your family's life. Hey, we're here to pray for you and to stand with you. Will you email us and let us know that you're uh, hearing what God is saying through this ministry and that you want to be a part of it? Uh, go on our website, check it out, and see what we have there to offer to help you in your walk with Christ. And our announcer has some things to share with you, so stay tuned. And uh, until this time next week, may God richly bless you and your family. If you would like to have this message in its entirety, please log on to our website at whcnorth.org or call 706-374-6175 during our regular business hours. Can't seem to find time to get into God's Word? Need an encouraging word at the right moment? Pastor Ace's daily devotions are available on our website at whcnorth.org. Use the Devotions tab and simply add your email address in the box provided or download the app for your smartphone. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512. 